All right. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon. We're going to talk about um, engagement in working with psychosis, which is really the very first step in how uh, we begin to work with this uh, program. How do we move the, for the slides forward, Jamie? Oh, this thing. Aha, oh, uh -huh. very good. First, we have to be smarter than the PowerPoint. Okay. Nope. Oh, now it seems to be. Okay. Very good. So uh, when we, when my uh, colleague and I, Harry, begin to train uh, teams regarding working with schizophrenia, we first talk about the main models uh, about how we think about schizophrenia. We're all familiar with these models. The stigma model, which is something that we all struggle with um, each and every day that we're working in this field. So I'm not gonna go through that. The medical model is something that we deal with on a frequent basis. And the medical model is important. That's not to be thrown aside. Um, but the recovery model is the current model that I think is most effective and most respectful to both the client and the mental health provider. And so that's the perspective that we're gonna work from today. Um, it is a really, um, uh, here we go. What are we doing? Come on. Ooh. There we go. This may take a little bit. <laughs> the recovery model uh, really puts the person in focus instead of the condition that we're working with. Uh, it takes into consideration that psychosis has a lot of multiple causes. It's just not biological or genetic. Um, symptoms of psychosis uh, are really variants of normal experience. We've all had the experience of thinking that somebody's perhaps called our name or that our cell phone has gone off and we've checked it. Um, and we've turned around to look to see if somebody's called our name or if our cell phone has gone off only to find out that that hasn't happened. And, and that is by definition uh, a hallucination, some sensation that we think has happened, but it really hasn't. So that is, um, you know, at the mild end of some psychosis type experience. And people living with a condition of psychosis are experiencing something at the more severe end. So when things get at that more severe end, we're looking at it from a disability perspective. It really parallels in some ways um, the addiction model it's a no blame, no fault condition, but there is a, a sense of responsibility that goes with that. Um, individuals are capable of taking an active role in their recovery and treatment really needs to um, underscore that. Uh, people are responsible for their own lives. Communities are, are responsible to help and that's very true in the addiction arena as well too. Um, communities have been available to uh, bring about AA and NA and DRA meetings, and now NAMI is out there. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that um, in working with mental health, uh, the, the community and the recovery model is really beginning to step up, and we need to begin to do that. And this is all part of engagement um, in working with psychosis. So a number of interventions can help, and we begin to do that, what is with this little clicker thing? With beginning to find some common ground. Am I keep, doing No, keep talking. Okay, keep talking. So we begin to find common ground uh, with somebody, which is what um, engagement really is all about. So um, a patient uh, or a consumer, a client will present with their own needs and wants. And of course, a provider brings in, uh, or a family member will bring in a client uh, with their needs and wants. And oftentimes, those are very disparate needs and wants. The patient may say, you know, I don't know why I'm here. I'm not sick. People want me to be on medication. They're feeling very anxious, confused. And the family may say, and the provider may say after an assessment, oh my goodness, you need medication, you need to be in therapy. Of course, those are very opposite things. How do we engage when there are two 
very opposite things going on. It's very hard to find common ground. This is not working, there we go. So let's talk about how to do that and why things are so disparate. You've all probably seen an image like this. When our sensory integration systems are functioning well, most of us see what's not there. Most of us see a triangle. The triangle, of course, I mean, we see the black outline triangle, but we also see the triangle that's missing, the triangle that's gone. Um, that's because our sensory integration system can look at that figure and, and fill in what's missing. However, when we're struggling with a sensory integration system that's not working well, then hallucinations and delusions begin to take place uh, because we can't fill it in quite right. So we may get um, a lot of anxiety. We may think of that perhaps as having some meaning that um, you know, maybe there's meaning to a six-pointed star or maybe there's meaning to figures that look like Pac-Man. Um, a lot of anxiety begins to get caused. There's meaning where there might not be for anybody else. And as a result of that, um, there's a lot of fear. So for those of us with good, healthy integration systems, we can say, oh, there's a missing triangle. And we have a lot of good common language about that. We can all look at each other and say, wow, that's really cool. We can see that and we can talk to each other about that. We can immediately develop common ground. We immediately have language about that that we can develop a community around, okay? But when we don't have uh, common language about that, when I'm somebody who puts meaning onto something because I can't figure out what's missing or my integration system is a little bit off, then I'm all of a sudden on an alien landscape without any way to confirm my experience with anybody else. My language is gonna sound perhaps nonsensical. I'm not gonna be able to share my experience. Uh, my symptoms then become become really a creative maladaptation to fill in what I think is missing. And as a result, people are gonna be kind of scared of what I say. I end up feeling ashamed and scared. I end up isolated, discriminated against. I experience profound aloneness and a sense of being wrong or damaged. So we can see how important the engagement process is. It means that we need to, as mental health providers, uh, we need to uh, really check our attitudes and our actions and begin to understand how this lack of common language and lack of common ground can lead to isolation and really exacerbate symptoms uh, in ways that we often aren't even aware of. And so, Perhaps the most important factor in beginning to engage with somebody who's living with a condition of psychosis is friendliness. In fact, when clients scored what's most important for their mental health provider, really the top thing was friendliness, above and beyond even competence. Competence was up there, but friendliness was more important. So we can be great, competent providers, but if we're not open, if we're not able to hear, if we're not able to validate, then all the competence in the world isn't gonna do us a whole lot of good if we can't connect with our client in some way. Additionally, optimism is really important. We need to be able to um, instill hope. Uh, employees, um, employment specialists who had a lot of optimism and were able to inspire, were able to get employment, <clears throat> excuse me, employment for their clients at a higher rate than those who were unable to inspire that hope and who did not present with that kind of optimism. Befriending is, uh, is an actual technique. In fact, it's an actual type of therapy. It focuses on safe topics, and what that centers on is really learning about the person. 
uh, their interests, learning from them, finding some strength or um, really likable thing about them. Uh, this has to be genuine. It can't be kind of like, um, I'm digging this up because I have to do this. It really needs to be a genuine uh, thing that you notice about your client that you really, really uh, enjoy. You might even do some really pleasurable things in your um, sessions with the client. Uh, one of the things that I have done is to bring in sketchbooks, um, instructional sketchbooks, and I'll sketch with clients who tend to be more um, uh, kinetic or active, uh, that they tend to talk a little bit more when they're doing something, and that works uh, a lot. So if their hands are busy, it's a lot easier to say, hey, so what's going on? Um, did you hear from the voices this week? What were they saying? And somehow it's a little bit easier to share that if the hands are busy. It's perfectly okay to give practical assistance. Um, you know, there's a fine line between giving advice and saying, you know what, I'd be glad to hook you up with an employment specialist, or I'd be glad to send out an email um, for you if you're having trouble finding that email. The sole purpose of engagement here is to really understand and communicate what the person is saying without reacting or commenting. That's a quote from uh, Xavier Amador. Uh, simple reflection without expansion. So this is what's called validation. Keep in mind, validation is not about agreeing. It's not about condoning. It's not about anything like that. It's simply saying, I hear you, I hear you. And so reflection is really important um, that when you do that, you use the client's words, that you don't try to, to reframe that in any way. Um, you say simply exactly what you hear the client saying. It's uh, reflect to connect is what we call that. Uh, and then asking open questions shows a lot of interest and curiosity. Um, clients will be surprised that you might be curious about them. We call these tell me to, uh, more to explore questions. And it's important to focus on concrete details and the sequence of events. So what happened first? And then what, then what happened next after that? So it's a very neutral, curious style. When I first started working with um, clients who are living with psychosis, um, my supervisor would say, you know, you have this kind of lilt in your voice, like, really? There was this <laughs> little bit of skepticism in my voice. And when I realized that, I checked that and realized that I really got uh, a lot farther if I kept it very neutral and very curious. Um, a lot of times people's anxiety and nervousness uh, come to the surface and that's really understandable, particularly if they're experiencing things that other people aren't experiencing and, and what they're experiencing is scary. Um, so we don't want to avoid that, but we also don't want to heighten that any more than what's needed. So <clears throat> it's probably important to check a little bit uh, yourself. So instead of um, going into, so how does that make you feel? Uh, rather to say, so I'm, I'm wondering what you make of that, or, or what's your thought about that, to take them back to the more um, thought-related questions rather than the emotion-related questions, but not to avoid the emotion altogether. Going for goals um, is also a good way to go, too. Uh, I know that um, going for goals is sometimes a really hard thing to do because, off, you know, as with every client that walks into a, a therapist's office, whether they're struggling with psychosis or not, most clients enter a, a therapy session with a fair amount of ambivalence no matter what they're struggling with. And so there's a little bit of finesse that goes along with uh, creating some goals or collaborating around goals. And we'll get to that in, in just a little bit. 
there needs to be some awareness of social interaction to involved with uh, engagement. So um, most of us who have been learning how to facilitate sessions or learning how to facilitate discussions have learned about uh, silence and the use of silence in a session. When working with psychosis, um, silence can be okay, but not too much silence. That can be a little bit of, um, a little bit scary. It can allow for too much time for uh, distraction or voices or other internal experiences to occur. So not allowing too much silence to take place. Eye contact, you may want to even ask your client what's comfortable and what's not for you. Sometimes I may sit kind of kitty corner to the client rather than looking straight at them because straight direct eye contact can be kind of threatening at times. Other times I may want to try to get the client, the client to look directly at me as a, as a way of just connecting but only for brief seconds at a time. Um, so that's something that you may want to negotiate with your client. Personal space is also important. I'll even say what's comfortable for you, for you. Would you like me to back up? Would you like me to get closer? Would you like me to sit to the side or straight on? And really giving your client the, the most um, control over what happens in the office, where you are, how you are with one another is really quite important is a person who hasn't had a lot of control in their life and this is a place where they can begin to have control. I tend to use a lot of laughter and humor in my sessions and so um, I find that to be very helpful but it's really really important to be very um, mindful and thoughtful about the client's perception of that humor and have it be very, very appropriate humor and not degrading in any way. Of course, sometimes we may not know, and if that happens, to be quick with an apology. Um, again, location, where does the client feel most comfortable and you know, make sure that um, you do your best to uh, allow for that to happen. I have a client who doesn't like those very harsh uh, fluorescent lights, so I went and bought some uh, lights that were less harsh, some table lamps and lit the office with those. And since then, she's found it much easier to talk with me and everybody that walks past the office says, ooh, you've got ambiance in your office. And um, it really does look nicer. <laughs> um, you also may want to think about how you organize and lead the meeting. You may want to do shorter sessions slow, gradual sessions. You may even want to split the session up into two pieces, two 20-minute sessions with a 10-minute um, break in the middle. Maybe get up, do some stretching, walk up and down the hallway um, just to stretch and get a break and come back to it. The desired outcome here is for this person to be heard and feel validated. Um, genuinely hear this person in a non-judgmental, compassionate way with acceptance and with all the genuineness that you can muster. And of course, instill that hope. Okay. So here are some quick tips. If you're gonna provide a little bit of psychoeducation, which is always helpful with engagement, Ask permission before you do. So that might sound like, is it okay if I, you know, give you a little bit of information or do you feel like you've, you know, got enough? And if I'm going to give information, sometimes I'll write that down or I'll ask them to write it down so that they don't have to uh, use any more working memory than what's required and they can take it with them. Sometimes I'll provide them with a binder and they bring the binder with them to each session and they can put information in the binder that they can take home. And when they need it at home, they know exactly where the binder is and where to find the information. So again, their working memory capacity isn't too engaged. Common missteps that can happen, and it's really easy to fall into, is giving unsolicited advice. Um, you know, some examples are, have you tried knitting? Well, that's great until perhaps there's a, um, 
you know, an uprise in anger, and then all of a sudden the knitting needles become, you know, uh, less than safe, or, you know, let me help you uh, clear out your apartment, and, you know, the case manager and the client clean out the apartment, and the next day the apartment is filled back in with all the mattress pads and all of the stuff that was cleaned out the previous day. Um, so it can also feel a little bit of, of controlling and, and those things may be, feel very comfortable to the client as well. So uh, we want to watch out for giving uh, unsolicited advice. Here are these barriers to engagement. Um, certainly the client factors are their own symptoms and their own blocking beliefs. They may have messages from growing up um, that they have decided on their own or that may have been fed to them inadvertently with all the good intentions of their family. There may be cultural or religious background factors. Um, a lot of times people have grown up with messages like it's not okay to be angry or, you know, I'm supposed to be content in everything that I do, or it's not okay to air my dirty laundry or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, having to deal with those kinds of belief systems may be a barrier. Of course, our own belief systems can certainly block that. Now these mental health provider factors on this side, um, for me, I have to say, I would love to say to you that I don't have any of those, but that would be a flat out untruth. I run up against these every day. And as much as I'd like to say I don't, I do. And I have to check myself on these things. Um, there, I do not run up against people with psychosis or dangerous. I know better than that now, but I still in my heart say, oh my gosh, I really have to help this person. Um, I'm worried about upsetting them. Uh, sometimes I wonder if this person is ever going to get better. And of course, you know, I have to check myself on that. And so um, my own sense of um, will I ever get over these belief systems kind of plagues me. Um, and I consider it a real stride on my own part that I can check these rather quickly. So don't, you know, and of course I go, oh no, I have shame because I still have these thoughts. <laughs> but I think that that's just really part of being a mental health provider working in a very, very difficult field. And the gold nugget is, is that we can catch these thoughts and work with them. And in, in a way then become a model for those clients that we work with. So um, goals, getting to goals it's very important to find out what the client wants. And the client needs to lead that. In fact, on the consultation sheets, we always have, what is it that the client wants out of this consultation or this experience? Go slowly, looking for small steps. But, you know, like we said before, it's really hard for anybody to really know what they want from the counseling experience or the mental health provider experience. Uh, we all come in with ambivalence. So there's a, there's a couple of things that can often happen. Sometimes the um, goal that they uh, want is so big and huge that it's impossible to meet. Uh, like I would really love everyone to understand that I'm the president of the United States. So if the goal is that big, then um, the way to look at that is to take a look at the values underneath, to pick around the edges of that goal. And, um, you know, if that were the case, how would life be different for you? Uh, what would you be doing differently? How would people be treating you if that were the case? And you can begin to see a little bit of the values and how they would like people to be treating them, what's missing perhaps in their life. And you can begin to do some short-term work to improve um, their life uh, in the short term. For those who really have no goals or very, very vague goals, you can begin to work with their values. Having them identify values, there are lots of values lists that you can download online. There are also card sorts um, that you can use that have uh, just cards with values on them. You can pick out values that you think would pertain to your client and have them just sort through those. 
and begin to uh, have them identify from the values that they pick out what might be useful for them and work from there, kind of from the other end. So engagement strategies summary starts with an attitude and mindset. It starts with building a strong and um, solid friendship with relationship strategies. It might be practical strategies, playing games, um, reducing stigma, um, helping with some of the cognitive difficulties, certainly normalizing, um, even with your own experiences. Ask and listen with intent to understand where your client is coming from and helping them to begin to see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that they can live a meaningful and full life just like anybody else who's struggling with a chronic uh, illness. And so what is this person experiencing? What does their landscape look like? What are their hopes and dreams? What do they want out of being with us? Engagement is the first step in the process. And uh, there we have it. I'm guessing I talked more than 15 minutes, but I hope you got out of this what I intended to share. 